Okay. Good morning, everyone. In today's episode, I wanted to give myself <coughs> a bit of space to actually uh, play around with the idea of the simulation. Yeah, so pretty much, um, here, let me begin like this. If right now somebody tells you, wh what is your personality as a human being? What is it? What is it made of? Made of, you know? That means we look at atoms and we're like, what is that made of? You know, we, we broke the atom down to see the smaller particles. Mr. Within is saying, if you broke down that idea of you, <coughs> that I thought, you know, um, that thought of you, what would you find? And some people have wondered about this deeply. Some people have not. <coughs> However, the conclusion that there are certain elements, not elements, but certain states of mind that can feel simulated. For example, that moment when the person is angry at the wrong person, like somebody, you, you see it in these YouTube videos, like there's three people in a line, <coughs> the person uh, in the far end, the third person at the back of the line, taps the shoulder of the person in the front of the line and then the second person is blamed by the first person so you see the anger in that instant it is simulated it is a simulated validity Now something remarkable has happened <coughs> where the human being has translated uh, its meaning through language and it has built a conscious code. That means sometimes when I speak I feel I am building something but not something that is per se physical in the moment. You know how like if you had a paintbrush in your hand <clears throat> and you, um, let's say imagine you had paint on your hand and you move, you touch something, the paint would leave an imprint. And that's what I mean, that sometimes when I speak, I feel that the language is having a subtler presence. In one talk, I playfully suggested that uh, the third eye is actually how the brain is projecting itself outwards.
the ancient yogis considered life to be a dream. We are now wondering if life is a simulation, <clears throat> which is the same question, to be honest, resurfacing, but through a totally different context and platform. If I consider the origin, the cause of the world to be materialistic, then everything, anything that appears immaterial feels like the dream part of it. That means we are like atoms, electrons, dreaming that we are minds. <clears throat> or it's kind of like looking at a tree and reducing it to just its color. You know, imagine me looking at this tree and I'm like, this tree, this isn't a tree, this is just color. You know? But we see the color is not the tree. You see that we can't even see inside the tree when we look at it from the outside. That there are dimensions that are unknown. <clears throat> there was this idea of the veil of thought. Alan Watts spoke about it. In the Sufi tradition, there was a veil that only from the other side it would be opened. The poet Rumi has a quote. He says, I have lived on the edge of insanity, wanting to know reasons, <clears throat> knocking on a door. The door opens. I have been knocking from the inside. When I think about the idea of the simulation, <coughs> And the idea of the truth, we ask, where is the truth? That means if this world is true, we experience it momentarily in attention. Now, if this world is a simulation, we are still experiencing it momentarily in attention, but conceptually, the simulation I've always implies there is a previous existence. So, when life has appeared like a dream, I mean, anybody who's seen the movie Inception, what was one point that that film made? <clears throat> from the beginning, you don't remember the beginning of a dream and you don't remember the ending of a dream. Now, human beings, they can't remember their origin and they don't know what happens after. You know, we can't see that far even to see how the species, how extinction is going to come about. <clears throat> So the idea is that the simulation needs to have truth. That means who is experiencing the simulation, which is the mystical algorithm. Who is experiencing this reality that is composed of various changing elements? As if not only the world is changing in front of your eyes, but the world is also changing behind your eyes. And there is these deeper eyes even within you that are witnessing the whole thing. You know, and from the mystical angle when we perceive it. <clears throat> For me, it's as if the simulation and the truth are codependent. That means if there was no man, there is no need for the concept of God. Have you noticed? You know, there's a reason that many uh, religious people uh, um, um, uh, early on after the 6th century when religion 
uh, sparked, got ignited in our history, you see a lot of those religious people went to people who could speak, people who could understand. Why, why, why weren't we trying to save the souls of animals? You know, I mean, why didn't, why don't, why doesn't the the the, the um, Christian missionary priest back in the day not uh, share the truth, or the I don't know fakir back in the day? Why don't they share the truth with dolphins, with squirrels, with birds? Why was it that it was with the human being? Do you see? Do you see that in order to move, you require space? <clears throat> so in order for you to exist objectively to yourself, you require an absence, you require a conscious space. So I think it's fair to say that we have been thinking from the beginning of history that we're just creatures of matter. We're just matter in the space. Now we're wondering if the mind could be a field, how there could be an inseparability with attention and energy being everywhere. Excuse me. If there is a simulation, there must be a truth to it. Where is that truth? You know, it's it's the mysterious uh, inquiry of the subjective personality that is uh, extracting location from by just viewing simply. That means what the mind seems to be is a multi-dimensional location, a location where multiple dimensions are accessible. As I'm speaking right now to you, I could see various parallel ways that I could move, I could speak, and many things can move. So, you know, it's as if we are in <clears throat> a world where, by the nature of our movement, different dimensions of it activate. You know, there is a dream-like, sequence-like feeling to this world. I think it's the nature of our experiential design. That means we feel we our reality is simulated not only because we blink, not only because we sleep, that's like the world's blinking, 
<clears throat> the whole moment's blinking. But if the existence continues, so really, we as conscious creatures, we're not conscious 24-7, you know? That means I have, I have, I think once I met someone who they said, they told me that in their dream, uh, in their deep sleep, they were conscious. But they had no reference or relevance to their individualhood. You see, it's with identification. You know, you go into a football stadium, you know, based on the jersey you have, you have a sort of identification. You can identify with both sides of the spectrum. <clears throat> and so human beings, there are a certain amount of them are uh, identifying with the nature of reality being more mind than matter. Because the issue with matter is that there's no problem. I totally understand that we need empirical evidence, especially <clears throat> that's how we have polished the medical sciences. But, but at the same time, but at the same time, it's the absence of the free will. So you can't have it both ways. You can't be completely matter and have free will. Free will will be a hallucination if it's just matter. You know, if you are more than matter, you can't be just a materialistic being. So do you see either you are known nothing or you are, you are unknown everything? And human psychology has dabbled with this so many times. Do you know, because I started noticing a mystical pattern when I was studying different religions and I was like, what is the idea here? Why has the human being arose? What made the prophets care enough for the world that much? Because if you can totally see, <clears throat> man doesn't really, because he's focusing on his survival, there is no feeling of, of like pr preserving something more. My memories feel like simulations to me when I attempt the phenomena of remembering. <clears throat> that means the event passed. The memory is a simulation or a relatively accurate simulation. <clears throat> I find it impossible to kind of remember something without changing the memory. So if you keep remembering something over and over and over again, certain elements of the memory remain the same, but certain elements of the memory change. So pretty much if reality was a simulation, the simulation is being comprehended in two ways. You know, matter is hallucinating personality <clears throat> or matter is the effect of intelligence. That means just like the sun has light beams, the intelligence that the human being truly is, its light beam is the human form. <clears throat> because really, where can individuals go? We see this with this life lesson when we see raindrops on our windshield. The raindrops merge. That means in this life, uh, the action of living automatically becomes integration when many creatures are living in the same space.
you know, guys, I just got a idea, a concept that I feel no one's done this and I may be the first. So I felt of doing it in our understanding of simulations, just generally for audiences. I thought just saw everybody on the planet. I was thinking, let us uh, wonder about different types of simulations where when trying to comprehend what a simulation is. <clears throat> that means just like an experience or, or, or a martial art technique, we're trying to constantly practice the technique to see uh, what the art of that simulation is. You know, um, I would say the idea of an ascending simulation and a descending simulation. An ascending simulation is where if the reality, if the world is considered to be <clears throat> a, simu a simulation, it is a simulation that is going towards infinity. And I would say a descending simulation is a simulation that is going towards the void. You know? Or we can even say um, <clears throat> ascending simulations are simulations that are like the natural... You know what it is? We should use the mathematical sense of natural number sets and whole number sets as if uh, the natural number sets be begins from 1, 2, 3, 4, da, 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 da. And then, and then it, we have the whole number sets beginning from 0, 1, 2, 3. So I would say we can call the descending simulation uh, or we can call it a whole simulation. It's starting with a 0. That means it considers a dimension of <clears throat> absence. But then an ascending uh, dimension is a, a simulation is a simulation that is beginning like a natural set, natural number set. So we can call this a natural simulation, you know, because the concept of the creator is singular. You see. That means the Judaic, the Abrahamic traditions, <coughs> religions. <coughs> God was an ultimate singularity of intelligence, being simultaneously the cause and effect. That's the sense you get if you're trying to somehow ex extract code from religion. <laughs> <clears throat> but um, the concept of a whole simulation, a simulation that is beginning from zero rather than a natural simulation that begins with the consideration of the dimension of the singular is that the void is really what we can't fathom and we can't even consider uh, uh, God's uh, fathomability of it. Do you know that means right now the whole psychology of the human being when it looks at its sciences is to some degree what's moving in the space, what's moving in the space. Even recently, not recently, but like scientists, like if somebody asks you, is what's, what moves faster than the speed of light? You know? <clears throat> Many people may not have an answer for that, but the answer actually is one thing that's moving faster than light potentially could be space. That space can expand. It's a mind-boggling concept, no? That space expands faster than light. It makes sense if the universe is alive because we need space before we can express. <clears throat> like I, you know, you, before you can buy furniture, you need a place to put it, you know? And it kind of feels like before the human being can uh, exist, it needs something to experience somewhere to experience sorry before the human being can experience it needs somewhere to exist so you know it's it's the questioning of the unknown origin <clears throat> and both religion and science I, can, I mean science of course is a method but usually the the people under the banner of science i should say for me science is incredibly mighty and crucial but the issue is that because it has retaliated, because I think it was Mark Twain, he had this quote where he's like, don't wrestle with a muddy pig, you'll get muddy. Now the issue is that science wrestled with the muddy pig, so it has made the same mistake. 
in the sense that of declaring the opposite. Do you know? Because if it, here's the thing: there, there is, there is a, neg, there is an idea that is the negation of one idea, and that's how it has its existence. It's dependent on another idea, and then there is an idea that stands on its own. You know, for me, the human mind is maturing beyond how language is just it. You know, that means for how how many eons are we just gonna like? Imagine we call this a tree, and the word tree. Imagine, um, 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 uh, uh, let's say 3,000 years pass, we're still calling this a tree. Wouldn't that freak you out? It would be freaky if language doesn't evolve. And I feel that when people have been, people have been banished from uh, the kingdoms of greater knowing on this planet. What I mean by that is that if you don't know your value, most likely the world is giving your value. The world is giving you a value. <clears throat> you know, it's like that saying, they say move in the world or the world will move you. You know, move or be moved by the world. <clears throat> and how we move the world is actually we move as it, but through the individualization of the self. So for me, of course, yesterday seemed like a dream, seemed like a simulation compared to today, you know? I know that this r moment right now is going to feel like a simulation to the moments afterwards, you know? So I don't know if we as human beings have to separate our intelligence from the idea of the human being and if, um, <clears throat> how intense that task would be. <clears throat> so the idea I'm saying is that if the person can discriminate, there is a simulation, how are they discriminating that simulation and how is that simulation there? That means the truth has nowhere to go other than to exist. Do you know the concept? If, if we consider there is a truth. Now, most people are considering subjective truths. That's why they're, waiting, they're trying to see if life fits their story. I mean, this world is too big. You know, it's like before uh, your prayers are answered, you're going to have new prayers. You know, and before those prayers are answered, you're going to have new prayers, you know. And so what does this mean? That means man is his own response in regards to how alert and clear his attention is to his ability. Because what is the point? I mean, what is the point of a weak civilization? What is the point of a scared civilization? What is the point of an inefficient civilization? What is the point of creatures that can notice and discriminate a, a better way but not implementing it? <coughs> That's as if, imagine, Da Vinci never painted, you know? You know, it's funny. People think there's the concept of bullying. They don't realize. If you were to look at the origin of the idea of bullying, you would see that there was war. Do you know? And man, before war, he was being bullied by the elements. He was being bullied by that uh, tiger chasing him in the jungle. You know? Back in the day, enlightenment was like a moment where you, you know, a vicious animal stopped chasing you and you could just look around for a second and be like, oh, nice, okay, now I'm going to start running this, you know, saber-toothed tigers chasing me. <laughs> ah, excuse me. You know, it's kind of like asking the question, how do we know we are energy? <clears throat> how do we know we are energy? How does anyone know anything in a changing world? That is the question. 
how can we know anything accurately? So everything actually is being simulated. That means when a person, for example, tells a joke or tells a story and then looks at the other person and he's like, you know what I mean? And that other person's like, yeah, I know what you mean. It's, it's like, it doesn't mean this, the, the, actually the other person knows how you mean it in the way you said. The person means what they can see from it. So what does that mean? We are simulating our ways towards our, our, we're simulating our, yeah, our ways towards the truth. What does that mean? Towards the truth state. That means we are creatures that have no choice. We're, we're kind of like thrown into this world poetically like asteroids, but the asteroid goes into, imagine the center of the earth and makes a hole. Okay, usually asteroids have spherical impact, but I'm, but I'm telling you, imagine if the asteroid went into the <clears throat> earth and it made a small hole, like as if the earth was made for, from cheese for a second, you know? <laughs> so the asteroid goes in the earth, I consider that to be ethnocentrism, I consider that to be the conditioning of the human being. You open your eyes in this simulation from a part of it, and others open their eyes uh, to the simulation from a part of it and the reason it appears as a simulation because we can't see all of it we can see the part of it that we are being <clears throat> so what does that mean that means as long as the unknown is there of course there's it's gonna feel like a simulation I have no idea how life cannot feel like a simulation and the moment you have a single zero point whatever amount of zeros you want one percent of an unknown factor in the in the moment uh, the whole thing could be hollow you know <clears throat> I honestly feel our consciousness is like an ego. In front of our eyes, it localizes on a branch of knowledge. Behind our eyes, it seems like it's like flying in the sky, having an ability to uh, scroll over various, various memories, various visualizations, various geometrical patterns. You see, the issue is that we have been uh, told that what is behind us is nothing not realizing that this nothing is the seer. <clears throat> so I don't think it's enough. I don't think it's enough for us to just feel like we're objects with names. It doesn't explain it enough, you know? There is a strangeness because the beautiful thing that only a philosopher can do, many people won't dare because they, they have a sort of cultural thing because let me tell you because philosophers their <clears throat> notion was that it didn't matter who you were there was something more important to the world that surpassed the hierarchical class system of any kind do you know how many mystics and philosophers have scolded kings and emperors trust me the emperor was a human being somebody sometimes they needed somebody to talk sense to them even if the person was an emperor you know whether it was their son being like, hey, dad, can you stop killing the people you're meant to be protecting, you know? And the emperor father's like, no, son, because if I don't kill these people, they're going to kill me. <laughs> and there we go, French history. No, I'm joking. <laughs> For me, every part of the world has an exotic component to it. You know, anywhere you go, it's as if, like, at least considering to your intelligence, it's never before seen, you know? That means I got tired of counting. You know, there was a time where I was like, okay, is this, this is Monday, this is Monday's self, this is Tuesday's self, this is Wednesday's self, this is Thursday's self, this is, uh, you know, Friday's self, this is Saturday's self, this is Sunday's God self. <laughs> You know, like, so I, I would count only to see that these are the sands that are falling from the hourglass, the temporary nature of how we are traveling through space and time. You are a pilot of consciousness 
in this universal sector through the human form. That means really, like, it's not that we should reduce man's ego to completely nothingness, you know? <laughs> There's certain schools of thought that, that they, they reduce the person to such emptiness, even though the, the concept of simulation stands, remember. But the thing is that it's like, it's like, it's like, so what you saw the cup was empty. You'll realize its design was made to be full. This life is like a canvas and you are the paint of your genetics. You're just painting a certain life impression on this world and uh, drifting. You know, we, we're again like birds that just are like, all right, enough of this forest, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> <clears throat> our advantage is, is, is our language has room to grow. And for a while I was thinking like, why did we stop after the, alpha, uh, after the letter Z? Why? Why after the letter Z we didn't keep evolving and updating the alphabet? If it was me, the educational system uh, shouldn't allow any student to graduate any grade, whether it's university or high school. <clears throat> Let me tell you, without, the only way they can graduate is that every child has to plant a tree. Has to, in order to graduate to the next year. <laughs> And has to create a word, a concept no one has ever known, only their eyes has found, you know? And then the child can graduate. Because the issue of the educational system is that it's, it's, it's just meaningless assignments and teachers who throw those assignments away. I am telling you, we need to get serious about what it really means for there to be 8 billion creatures on a rock in the middle of nowhere, these 8 billion each have their inner realm is like a simulation in accordance to their experiences, but the outer existence they all share. So we're in one world, but we all see it differently. How phenomenal. And we think there's such a thing as normal. It's like, <laughs> man, I knew culture was made on thin ice, but I didn't know it was the ice was this thin, you know? <laughs> What does that mean? That means we are going to notice that I think what's going to happen is that a human language of experience is going to arise. Because all living is is sparking the new. I can't remember at any moment in my life that for that moment, it was, it, it's like every moment is new. You know what it is? It's like <clears throat> we experience like, let's say the morning, imagine yourself an hour ago. That hour ago experience, let's say, was like a piano key. And it's as if we are honestly like a piano where throughout the day, it's as if different um, resonance, different, different sounds of different states of mind, you know? So it's, I believe it or not, living is actually playing the instrument that is this biological potential. For me, it's as if, here's the view. Sure, I could see myself as just an individual, and that's it. That's easiest. That's like basic. That's like how it starts. But if you wonder about where can the individual go, you will see just society, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, any sort of <clears throat> sociologist will tell you this, that people realize they went towards people. We went towards knowing more than knowing less. Can you imagine a civilization where the less you knew, the more cooler you were? You know, right now where I, people are idolizing professors that are just... Um, loops of history. But what if we suddenly realize the person who didn't know perhaps had noticed something about 
the knowing's illusion, the knowledge's illusion. That means the question, the whole point of this episode was I wanted to fathom, just kind of brainstorm and see, like, how, if life is a simulation, how you get out of it. One way is you nullify the simulation, so you say it was never a simulation, so you never need to even get out of it. That's one approach of getting out of the simulation. It never was a simulation, right? So technically, that's the way you're out of the simulation. You're not in a simulation because it never was a simulation. The other thing is, it's a simulation and it's like a puzzle. It's like the lifetime is an algorithm, at least in spirituality or in spiritual traditions where they felt there was a continuity beyond the temporary lifespan. For them, it was a sort of, they had this con concept, it's at least in Vedic thought, where it was called karmic uh, depth. That means the person had something karmically they had to do and then they could leave the simulation, this wheel of karma, you know? Different angles have been on it. There's this story about this very notable yogi uh, named Sri Ramana Marshi, a very important figure that I feel they should teach in schools. I honestly feel they should teach Sri Ramana Marshi his teachings in schools. <clears throat> it helps with the extreme uh, extremeness of identity in, in, in the climate of modern times, you know? that you are an observer of phenomena before you identify it. You identify with it, you know? That means before you wear the jacket, you're not the jacket. Sri Ramana Marshi, um, one day his disciples come up to Sri Ramana Maharshi and they, because they've noticed that one of the people in the ashram, Sri Ramana Maharshi is not giving teachings, is not giving meditation techniques. This dude is working like a horse. What does that mean? He's cleaning the ashram, cleaning the ground, uh, handling the food, handling everything like a machine, nonstop like a machine working. <clears throat> And so the students go and they're like, Ramana, why is this guy just working? What about him? Doesn't he need to get enlightened? You know? She, Ramana Mar, she says something to them. They all get goosebumps. You know, they're, <laughs> they're all like, oh shit. You know, they suddenly realize. She, Ramana Mar, she says, this man, this guy who you guys see who's doing all the hard work and the work nobody wants to do, it's because... He is finishing his karmic depth. And once he does his work and his karma finishes, he will no longer incarnate. And the students were like, whoa. Like they were, they were, their minds were um, reignited. So that's the Vedic approach. The Vedic approach is deep. You know, for the Sufi mind, the Sufis have, were very, the dervishes, they were, they were very... They understood the power of the love of them of the divine. That means you can see everybody has a rose as a personality, but how have they dissolved their personality before their physical body is dissolved? One approach was through love, back to yoga or the Sufi path of love, you know, where the person no longer was just an individual activity. They realized they are energy. Energy cannot die. It just changes form to form. But the forms don't necessarily relate to one another. Do you know that means what we are, this sort of consciousness, energetically has never died. Because it's for me, it's, it's strange. There, you know, it's as if they say energy cannot be created or destroyed, but then the universe, suddenly the Big Bang happened and everything suddenly came out of nowhere. But what we're, what, the energy can't die though. So that means energy was there before there was meaning. And if, if consciousness is attributed to energy, it was, it's there before meaning. If awareness, if, if, if the, who we really are is attributed as just energy conscious of itself before it is in, uh, clothed in information and 
behavior, then it's as if energy freaking out that it's just going to be, uh, become a different movement of energy. That means it's a liberation, it's a renunciation of the en concept of the world. Not the renunciation of the world. I have considered that there is something present here. And its presence is the observer and its personality is the moment from that conscious observance there is animate intent. It's as if Behind our eyes, we are living in a completely more able dimension, but in front of our eyes, we're not, but because they are linked, it's as if our physical life is being puppeteered by our inner considerations and witnessing of potential. That means when a person is articulating different potentials to a situation or a setting, or the person is like thinking what they should do in an emergency, right? So what is that? That is simultaneous world consideration. Human beings either think in images, or they think in words, or whatever the next language is, geometry or number. <clears throat> there was a man named, what was his name? <clears throat> Daniel something, Daniel Talbot, I forget his last name, but it was the savant that had memorized 10,000 digits of pi, and in his book he had explained how he had memorized those 10,000 digits. And the way he had memorized them was because the numbers, like this dude had closed his eyes, and numbers appeared to him as location. So the number nine, whenever he was like behind his eyes, the dude's walking in a world and he sees something tall and he says the number nine and it's the exact number in the sequence of pi, 3.14, da, 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 you know? Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, Akai Sasori, welcome to the chat section. Um, I actually responded. Uh, I shared that. L let me tell you what I what I how. Well, okay, here I'll answer your question first. I'm going to read your question so other listeners know. Guys, I'm reading the chat section of the talk here. <clears throat> Akai says, "Do you think that the world is a simulation due to the brain's way of perceiving? 
if there was no observer of the simulation, then it feels like the world would be real due to the lack of human brain. <clears throat> yeah, the thing I'm saying is that existentially, like, the simulation stops. So think about you being awake right now. Think about you. You're going to go to sleep tonight, and then suddenly there's going to be a gap, an absence of subjectivehood and objectivehood, and then you're going to wake up in the morning. So what does that mean? That means experience feels simulated, and existence seems to be the reality. Do you see? But the issue is, we are moving as the experience. Free will is in experience, but there is an existence underneath this experience, this layer of experience. Do you see what I mean? <clears throat> Let me say it even in a more profound way. Um, I had a dream, uh, Akai. In this dream, uh, what happened was I was moving. I remember it vividly. In the dream, I was running at a fast speed. I wanted to go left. I could go left. I wanted to go right. I could go right. You know, and at some point in the dream, I even ran at a speed that I couldn't run in real life underneath water. And I was standing there underneath water breathing. So I dreamed in, in the dream, I dreamed standing underneath water breathing. Now check this out. I woke up from that dream and I got shocked because I realized when the body is not conscious, when the body is asleep in the bed, the mind can simulate the experience of a body. That means we are such multidimensional creatures that when our body is asleep, the mind can still create a body we can feel, we can move. So what does that imply? That implies that the mind is living a simultaneous life. It's like an onion-style multidimensionality. Where the bigger sphere is mind, and the sphere inside that is the body. You know? So that's, that's the way I perceive it. You know? <clears throat> because there is this something. This My whole life, I, I kind of dedicated it, to, to be honest, to try to see how far I can push language on this earth. <clears throat> and the greatest teaching, I'll tell you, it seems, it feels to me as a teaching of another life, you know, where my eyes were open. But there was this man <clears throat> named Rishi Vyasa. And Rishi Vyasa, this was one of the most incredible human beings on this planet. At least I think, you know. <laughs> to be a little transcendentally egoic about it. <laughs> Rishi Vyasa was a unique human being who some people called him, he was the incarnation of God in language. And so this man, back in the day, wrote what is now known today as the 18 Puranas, which he wrote books on leaves. This dude wrote books on leaves at a time where people didn't even care about books. They're like, what's a book, bro? I'm trying to just find some food. You know, this dude was writing books. He was very ahead. <clears throat> and so Rishi Vyasa writes these 18 books on society and cultural development and some sophistication of him using metaphors to imply how behavior in that time should progress. So he writes the 18 Puranas, if I remember correctly, and I, I think it was 18. And so then, and he doesn't feel complete. He's made this, he's completed this incredible masterpiece, but he doesn't feel complete. He feels something is off as a being, he feels that. Now, legend has, the story has it, that it says that an angel through a human form comes to Rishi Vyasa. <clears throat> the angel tells Rishi Vyasa, the only way you will feel complete <clears throat> is if you write 
about your love of the truth. Write about your love of the truth. And so it was in that moment where it was as if uh, Rishi Vyasa was living for the world. But then the angel came and said, now live for the truth of yourself and the world. You know, no longer just selfless service even. Rishi Vyasa realized that he has to write for his love for the truth and <clears throat> he authored the Bhagavad Shirimat Bhagavatam, the Bhagavad Gita, the story of Arjuna and Krishna, you know, an archer on a battlefield in which God visits him, you know. And for me, you don't know. I mean, like, maybe some advanced communicators might understand what I'm saying, but there is something just phenomenal when you see a human being go beyond. Whether it's in an astronaut, and the whole world's watching that astronaut go beyond the atmosphere. Whether it's a writer writing something that no one expected. We are creatures that once fascinated, all of life becomes our uh, proper, a great rhythmic energy, you know? <clears throat> so it was when Rishi Vyasa dared to write about his most vulnerable vision, on reality that he opened up to a character no longer in a story you see we are characters in stories now in the future you know extinction means the world goes before I <laughs> extinction means we go the world takes it out takes us out or we take ourselves out you know <clears throat> what we can totally know that in the future uh, there's going to be mistakes, but there's also going to be correct actions. <clears throat> I noticed that mysticism this idea that life is a simulation, usually the first idea is, I want to get out of this simulation. What is this? <laughs> it's like simulation? Ew. You know? <laughs> Reality is a simulation. And then, the, you know, you want to get out of it. But for me, it, it's more like if, if it's an impulsive... Let me, let me tell you, it's like study something before you let it go and study something before you pick it up. Human beings have access to natural intelligence. I'm not kidding. We're natural beings. We are rhythmic. That's what nature's animate dimensions mean. You know? We can totally see. Like that, um, a squirrel on a tree may have no concept of why a human being is going to work. You know, but that squirrel can still see the human being. So just because we see it doesn't mean we understand it. It's like just because you see a tree, imagine seeing a tree and then trying to like, you know how complex that would be as if somebody doesn't have a concept of a seed, but sees a tree and it's like, how did it disappear? Holy shit. You know? So the person would suddenly, it would take a while until they suddenly see in a different dimension, they plant a seed and it becomes a tree. You know, nature is, it's like it feels we're in, a na we're in nature's mind right now, you know. That's, that's as mystical as it gets. It's like nature here before man was. <laughs> we're all simulations of nature, you know. It's like what happens when nature gets an ego? Individual creatures uh, populate the solar system. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> so, 
So, out of curiosity, Akai, do you want me to respond to your last two comments in the chat section? Do you want me to share my view or... Because really, I'm just saying life is more than a story. And we know this because we learn language. The child doesn't, isn't born and it's like, hey, everybody, I'm here now. You know, the child doesn't speak when it's born. It's not a, it's not a, it's as if we, pro, our behavior programs our environment. Okay, so, so Kai, um, first of all, thanks for engaging again. Um, I'm not going to read your whole comment, <clears throat> but I'm going to respond to it. The last thing you say, extreme stillness seems to be the result of going beyond. Okay, here's the thing. If we go towards too much collectivity, we will undervalue the individual. We go too much towards individuality, we will undervalue the collective. For me, it, it, it's like just being conscious of two simultaneous lives being lived. It's an odd idea. We usually think we're just one being, but not realizing everything's dualistic. Just you have two hands, you have two eyes, you have two ears, two nostrils, you know. There's a dualistic component to nature. Things emerge in twos. It's like, what is this? Is nature learning to count through creaturehood? <laughs> For me, I, I thought about it. What if man suddenly found... <coughs> Let's say we suddenly found nature's mind. Suddenly we found a way to communicate with the oversoul of the planetary sector, universal sector, of the planet, let's say. And imagine we communicated with the mind of the planet and we realize the mind of the planet is like a child. Do you know? Imagine. Imagine we realize God's a little kid. You know, it's <clears throat> this idea of simulations, you know, echoing. We look at an ant and what looks at us. <clears throat> so I would say, Akai, you say, I'm, I'm just saying this. Traditional mysticism, uh, a sort of escapism out of the illusion of the world. I'm suggesting this idea with the advanced communicators thing that I keep saying and the pilots of consciousness, that after you go into that Taoistic... <clears throat> abidance as the presence of your whole moment. Um, I feel when you go there, your antenna uh, is polished, is, is set clear, resets, and then you hear a signal beyond the simulation of yourself. So for me, I honestly, I feel like an antenna. Someone emailed me and he's like, hey man, how do you come up with your content? I'm like, bro, I'm looking at the world. That's how I come up with my content. You know? It's right in front of my eyes, yet mysteriously being watched from behind them. <clears throat> you know, this is, this is the world we live in. It's, it's like, really? We are calling it reality? We should call it surreality. What part of being on a sphere in the middle of nowhere is normal? You know, and we think there's normal people when the universe isn't normal, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> Can you imagine, like, some person back in the day where everybody used to wear top hats, gets a time machine, comes to the future, you know, and comes to the future <clears throat> and uh, sees nobody's wearing a top hat, you know. 
And then the person goes back and says, guys, the future is a dark place. And people are like, why? It's like nobody's wearing hats and everybody starts crying. Right? <laughs> so what I, what, I, what I mean by that is there is no such thing as a normality in an updating system. It is better to be dynamic <clears throat> than to be static. And um, see, even the birds are complaining from the truck about the trucks, you know. <laughs> The sounds of society, guys. This is the world we live in. <clears throat> Imagine in the future there's giant robots walking the street. How much more sounds we would hear. You know, many people, they can watch the movie Pacific Rim and being like, oh, look at that, fascinating, a giant robot running in the streets of humankind. But you know how much the sound would destroy the person's ears? You know, if the, the, all those people who are like right beside the foot of the transformer as it's running probably are like, you know, got, uh, have post-traumatic stress disorder or something, you know what I mean? Like the sound of it. You go into the unknown and you are a hunter-gatherer of your inner realm. Jesus Christ, this truck is... Patience brings about the ultimate silence. Really, there's no right way or wrong way to live, you know? <clears throat> the Japanese, they say, the man is the room he enters. What does that mean? Your personality animates in accordance to the environment. You know, that means the way I'm sitting right now has an influence on my talk. <laughs> you see, Akai, so guys, Akai says, brings up an important point. I'm going to make, I'm going to extract a general question out of your comment, Akai. So Kai says, I'm having issues with the religious woman getting ruffled because my expression is uncomfortable to her and she counters with the Christian Bible. <clears throat> See, here's the thing. Um, there is no need to convert anyone and take it from Galileo, Galilei, or I don't know how you pronounce it. <laughs> Galileo <clears throat> Galileo says you cannot teach anyone anything you can make them realize it <clears throat> uh, within themselves you can't teach anyone anything that means you have no reason to go and try to convert this woman to you, to your perspective you know it's you know I'm just saying that you have to start from her room you got to start from her inner realm. If you want to have, if you care and want to have an intellectual conversation with her, you got to go to her room. You know, you got to land like a bird. You got to fly out of your inner realm of conviction and go to the inner realm of the other person. You know, <clears throat> once I told my brother this, that the secret of all knowledge is to realize that every person that is living and has ever lived on this planet and will live is looking at the world from their world. That means when you realize everybody has their inner realms, you got to start from there. So I would say if she's bringing the Christian Bible, ask her what does it mean that the kingdom of heaven is within you? What does it mean when Christ said to be in the world but not of it? 
You know, what does the idea of the Holy Ghost mean? Do you know? What is the idea of the simultaneity in the Christian tradition? Of course, Christianity and Islam deviate here because in the Christian tradition, they consider that Christ is God. Um, in Islamic tradition, the prophet wasn't God. But at the same time, in all the religious books, God is everywhere and everything and also including nothing. So, you know, <clears throat> so the thing is, you got to understand that the, it's like she is using the Christian archetypal system, just like certain people use the Muslim archetypal system, some people use the Buddhist, whatever. You know, we, the, it's a role. It's a role that the person is playing behind their eyes to uh, function and go through the challenges of this life, you know. <clears throat> so I would tell you that ask her how she sees it. This is the thing. That means that ask her a question. Ask her a question so she has to think about her or what she is saying, you know? Because I'm telling you, for me, there was the greatest thing. I noticed it early on what the teachers would do is give you a mirror. The student doesn't want the teacher to teach it. The student wants to find the teaching. Do you see? So if you are, if there is something greater, you know, <clears throat> for me, I'm telling you, ask her what wisdom is. Ask her that why is the, uh, you know, honestly, ask her a question and just listen to her wisdom and see how she perceives a circumstance. You know? Because let me tell you, the thing about religion is that it is, the poet Hafez said it really nice. <clears throat> he, in his poetry he said, uh, the religions are like the big ships in the ocean. Remember, this is 700 years ago, this guy's writing this. He said the religions are like <clears throat> big ships, and the poets and the sages are like the lifeboats. Do you know? And what does that mean? That means it, they are massive collective systems. That means for a long time, guys, I was looking at ideology, not necessarily religious, just the nature of ideology. And I was like, what is this? When a bunch of people believe the same thing, it's like that belief is controlling all of them. The belief is like a collective being limiting the movement of all those beings. You know? Because you got to see people's eyes, what are they made for? Sometimes I look at life and it's not just, you know, everybody has to be a completely reset into a totally new self that accords with the rea general majority reality. We can't implement democracy when it comes to the inner realms because that would be savage because the DNA is different. That means even though in, in a democratic system, the majority is voting, but every person is different. Do you know? And yet even the majority is not the whole nation. So for me, I was always thinking, and I still look at politics today. I mean, I haven't given a lot of talks on how I feel, but in my book, in Civilization 2.0, which I hope the audience is patient enough to wait for it, <laughs> I speak about really the evolution of politics on this planet, that it's going to become life-sensitive. That man is not just going to be possessed by ideology anymore. We're going to stop being language worshippers. We're going to realize the experience has no linguistic leash on its neck. <clears throat> because for me, I understand the temporary nature of this reality. I've seen it from day one. You know, everything. And even we may not consider an animate component, but like even, for example, <clears throat> um, coffee. For me, the, how there, there's coffee in the cup is like there's life. The coffee's gone, there's no life. You see things come into manifestation. They, uh, they act their act. They perform their value and being, and then they move on. So for me, it's as if just breathing in this world and realizing how fascinating this is how far the cells on this planet made it 
And I salute. I salute bio biological evolution. That means it's like incredibly honorable how far we've come. <clears throat> and really, like it's like me, when I look at this bird right now, I'm like, what's the purpose of this bird? What's the life purpose of this bird? And its expression is simultaneously being its purpose. Doesn't get more Zen than that, folks. <laughs> Let me tell you something um, I, interesting that happened uh, of how, um, fle uh, how artificial the social uh, society, uh, certain dimensions of society can be. <clears throat> I remember that there was this person, the moment I started speaking about evolution, the person suddenly got offended. Speaking about evolution, you know? And I saw, the, I, I, I saw that person, you know? And I saw it's as if the person had this idea that it's, it's just an animate in a dream. You know, as if there, you know, of course, a sort of uh, religious fundamentalism, not, a, not in the savage extreme kind, just a fundamental religious perspective of, what is it, 6,000 years ago or something? <clears throat> like, I don't know if people know this, but for example, certain archaeologists in Egypt from European countries, they noticed that certain stuff in Egypt is much older than 6,000 years, but due to the religious sort of atmosphere of the nation, none of the archaeologists can say it's longer than 6,000 years. You know? And they can't say it's exactly 6,000 years. You know? I'm just telling you, we are living in language while we're actually being a physical phenomenon. And the simultaneity of the two, so the moment we forget it, we think we're just one thing. So I would say honor the inner realms of the people you meet and also honor their outer realms. And you can see anytime a human being doesn't honor the outer realms of another, it's because of two reasons. They are in their inner realms. They're locked in their inner realms. This was the thing that sages would see savage, violent people back in the day and they would pray for them. They would, try, they would hope that their eyes would open. That being violent... Uh, in, on this planet means that you have chosen to walk into the storm. So if you're being violent, just, just consider that um, magnifications of that violence can echo back at you. There is something in this life that the moment the mind expresses itself in a certain way, it is also play, um, uh, paving the road of its future to some degree. <clears throat> I would like to read for the audience a chapter from this book I wrote.
This is the third essay from a book called The Source of Language. I wrote this in 2015, I believe. How do you exist? <coughs> How do you exist? This question is not pointed at an individual mind that considers separation as the premise for reality. As all words <coughs> are found to remind all beings of a wordless, of a word, wordless unified paradise, how you exist in a common setting of consideration will find itself looking through the void mirror of destiny and realizing beyond the self all that is, is all that is. So who is asking the question? When ideology has become your artwork and you have self-inquired about the deepest aspects of the architecture of your consciousness and self-awareness, all reality demands a sky that holds all within nothing. If consciousness can be seen through geometric halos behind the head of a selfless monk, how does the yogi transcend the whispers of materiality, you know, with two T's? Materiality that suggests finishing a mission is the only way. Your attention is the only currency in an industry that is void to even begin with. Observe, study, then absorb the nature of your thought and wonder about the true nature of how we exist. Is language rigged with ignorance or is the consciousness so supreme that it is testing itself? All phenomena is an advent of consciousness. Consciousness as it remembers beyond the I am entity becomes a source of wisdom never before seen. The mystery of life is more exciting than the death of words. Beyond the conceptual reality, we are free beyond space and time. For God's sakes, we are beings in language, but we are not of it. As our world reminds how the bird of as as our <clears throat> as our as our world reminds how the bird of paradise was not caged in an earthen cage. Beyond the self, there are no questions and answers. The simplicity of complex creation is the creator. Be free beyond an idea. For the sadhu, for the sadhu, there is a war of language going on. The wonder of an eternal view is just the remembrance of a moment beyond the imagination that is light years ahead of a blind linearized logic. As equivocal <laughs> As equivocal as it may seem, there are always hidden paths in your reality, but they all lead towards the self-discovery of the source of mind, which language is just the shadow on the wall of. There is no battle with pure or impure thoughts. The source of language may be said to be like a group of peaceful pigeons blocking the sun but revealing the one light as they disperse into their innate natural disposition. We're not here to build temples and transcend through them. So do you really need the temple? Our economy, just like our science, must never forget about humanity. If there is a religion you want to pursue, let, in quotations, the word humanity never be forgotten. So if there is a religion you want to pursue, let humanity never be forgotten. I shall elaborate beyond technological paradigms for our car keys go into the engine when we open our eyes in the morning. Study how your consciousness <clears throat> excuse me. Study how your consciousness and transcend into your sincerest nature. And once you have played with the fullness of the world, wonder about the nature of the empty. Abstraction is a mountain peak in which every poet has wondered how to climb, but as the mystic knows, language is an unnecessary show. What is the essence of your self-awareness? And who are you answering to? In today's depression dash era, in today's depression era, ideology must be eradicatedly commanded into its proper place. But if God shall help us, your sincerity will also belong to the whole world. You're either with us or not with us or even beyond the yin-yang symbol. But the roots of your existence must be, must be sought from within. Could your sensory perception be sought from within? <clears throat> As you realize that every human being is in the universe of a suggested billion trillion stars, back in the day consciousness didn't exist and time and space cannot testify. 
playfully reinterpreted, the world is being drawn based upon how much we have drawn upon the mystery of the presence beyond person, uh, personality of nature. But as transcendental ideas confront the void and are synchronistically activated, one will soon realize the loving hand of an almighty intelligence beyond all, ah, that is made of the love of the whole universe. Listen to your greatest guide, the moment of existence that is now. Your hand is already on the steering wheel. The unknown nation of images that we call our imagination must be explored in empty and multidimensional ways. You are the source and you are beyond the you. Who is reading this book? Slow hand clap for the mind that is self-reflectively transitioning the world. Be more interested than an atheist uncle who is willing to be a robot because he thinks there is nothing else. There is an intelligence within nature that must not be ignored. Beyond unspeakable focus, the divine administers all things in space. Who holds the known and the unknown in their hand? And is it right or must it be left behind? Once the unattainable is observed, the attainable has promoted... Sorry, uh, once the unattainable is observed, the attainable has become a presence beyond the idea of a liberation beyond words. Kaleidoscope thinking must be promoted for the mystic that seeks the ultimate within, beyond the ideology that is too, tempor too temporal to wait. Who are you when eternity is your essence? Question mark. That was something I wrote in 2015, guys. It was an essay. There is a line in it that says, You are the source and you are beyond the you. So imagine uh, eternity being something that is caused that can never die. And regardless of its effect, the cause is still there. I would consider that an eternal idea. We have to be as curious as Isaac Newton. He's like, yo, did this apple just fall right now? <laughs> There is a quote from Zen Master Dogen. He says the whole moon and the entire sky is reflected in one dewdrop on the ground. That means all of this world is being contained in the simplicity of your attention just being here. That means, that, you know, that bird chirp, uh, chirping right now? That bird is nature showing us its art. The poet Rumi says, be living poetry. Don't just write it, don't just read it, don't just seek it, live it. Live like poetry, and you have succeeded the task of eons. Telopa says, let go of what has passed. Let go of what may come. Let go of what is happening now. Don't try to figure anything out. Don't try to make anything happen. Relax right now and rest. And Telopa is a Tibetan sage, guys. And the reason he's saying this is because many people are chasing something which is actually has to do with how the mind is in being in a state of being. 
that means spirituality. It's hilarious. You never have to do anything about it. it. It's not relevant to the doer that much. It's just being still and silent and noticing how reality is being before the uh, superimposition of a thought, of a containment, of uh, subjective symbolic linking with it. You know, that means it's like, imagine you call, a squirrel is in front of you and you're like, hey, squirrel, and the squirrel gets offended. It's like, my name isn't squirrel, why are you calling me squirrel? You know, imagine the squirrel's name is like Timmy. <laughs> the squirrel got offended because we thought it was that. And how many times in life have we just thought something is, is just that and then it wasn't that, you know? There's a reason in the Upanishads they say neti neti, you know? <clears throat> Pretty much the guru, the guru, like the students had asked too many questions, you know? And the guru was just like, not this, man, not this. <laughs> you know, in Zen, uh, they have this idea, they call it killing the Buddha. Let me tell you what I mean by it. It's this idea that this practitioner of Zen would go meditate and then suddenly they would think they were Buddha in a past life. And then the Zen master would come to him and say, kill the Buddha. You're not the Buddha. <laughs> Even Buddha wasn't the Buddha. <laughs> There is a sage named Seng Chao. He says, heaven and earth I, and I are of the same root. The 10,000 things and I are of one substance. Do you see? That means you don't even have to, you can totally not have a divine agency or character or story to reality. It could just be a substance-oriented phenomenon. You know? Reality is, is really, honestly, it's our minds are making it multidimensional. That means there's this idea that we never actually know what the outside is because the light beam hits the object, but it's like light beam's influence plus the, uh, the object. It's as if light is an imprint. You know, they define light as um, uh, the smallest energy carrier in this planet. That means, I don't know if people realize this. I might, I, I, recently, I evoked a new theory in my school of thought and um, I gave a talk about it, the light is geometry theory. And I had this idea that actually their geometrical design in the sun, in light beams, has sculpted the potential for human life. You know? That means if you want to know who sculpted um, these uh, creaturehood, I will tell you it's the sunbeam light beam. The sun is sculpting life all over the cosmos. <clears throat> if there are potential for in potentially intelligent particles, this is my, uh, this new evolutionary theory that I've recently come up with. Like yesterday, I, I released it officially. Proud moment of my life, sir. Many moments in my life, guys, I, I learned this from the movie Gladiator. There was something incredible about the movie Gladiator. I can't tell you how many life lessons I just learned from that movie. You know? <laughs> like that film inspired me to go and actually get a degree in film, you know. But I, I would consider myself as an uncommon director, you know. I remember when I was in film school, everybody was making cultural social films, you know. Nobody was thinking about where civilization was heading. Nobody wanted to make a science fiction film. And you know, uh, okay, anyways, I'm reminiscing. Let me get back to the talk. <laughs> so guys, Olivia says, uh, tell her that heaven and hell is a state of mind or consciousness. Yeah, what else could it be? <laughs> it's fascinating for me. I would say evolution. The purpose of objective evolution was subjective storytelling. Just like how Terence McKenna, the scholar, saw that in the future we are the intermediary for robots. 
that means human beings are going to be extinct but robots are going to go and endlessly explore like the cosmos or whatever a sort of technological you know transformer evolutionary outcome Guys, I'm just saying pretty much biological evolution is the intermediary for a subjective storyteller. That means objective phenomena evolved, known objective phenomena evolved into an unknown subjective uh, creator. I feel many things in nature appear antenna-like and sometimes I feel what if the sun was a broadcasting system you know it's broadcasting geometrical patterns you know that means there is a sort of imagine geometrical civilization inside the sun <laughs> you know You know, I don't know if there, if we, I mean, I can't declare boldly, <clears throat> I have theories, but not, I can't declare boldly that I know how, to, if this world was a potentially a simulation, how to get out of the simulation, but I would say I, I definitely know how to get out of the linguistic simulation. And what life is when you're no longer language-based you are experience-based, direct experience rather than indirect language. Language is a tool. When language becomes an Iron Man suit, you have become an advanced communicator that has also remembered the, their experience in the cosmos as the intelligence of their universal sector, regardless if it's particular or field like. The honor of the emergence of the galactic archetype of the human being, that the human being will feel as if space will become his home. Right now, the planet feels like home, outer space. Oh my God, what do we do with all this space? 
you know, but really outer space will one day become like our home. We will realize that we can, uh, the, the inseparability of matter and space and the ultimatum of the joy of the mind. For life is a melting candle, yet the light has a value. The poet Rumi in his poetry, he says that the light of the candle, <clears throat> once sunlight hits the candle light, it is inseparable. What does that mean? That means that it's as if your biology is an opportunity for your consciousness to tap into the universal rhythm of things. That means it's as if we are piloting our attention energetically. Yet attention, is it a stranger to the world or is the world its home? The mystery stands, the questions will roam the surface of this earth for eons. The cool thing is, Unlike robots, the human being can get off the chair of its belief. Beliefs are chairs. Linguistic identification with reality, they're all chairs. You know, you're sitting on a chair. Now imagine uh, your suffering is you sitting on a chair, a certain way of looking at the energetic value of your life. And uh, if you got off that chair, it would totally have a different meaning. You know, this is why um, all those people who use a branch the wrong way, for me, there's also this mystery of uh, what about the unknown? As if like you had, like I had no idea 10 years ago I would be someone speaking and giving a podcast like that. That, that idea was like, you know, 10 years ago, like it's like no way I would fathom it. But suddenly I felt steered this way, you know, by my decisions in life. <clears throat> and uh, so that's the thing and I wonder about 10 years later and I realize there's an unknown factor anytime I wonder about future unknown when I wonder about the past that I can't remember earlier then then that becomes unknown too so I feel that my knowledge is sandwiched between an inner unknown and an outer unknown and that the knowledge and the simulation feels in two ways that matter is simulating uh, mind and mind is simulating matter. When we have free will, it feels like mind is moving matter. When, when, when we are still and silent, it's like matter is moving mind. You know, so it's this inseparability. It's as if we're in two worlds, but we only have the language of one world to explain it. <clears throat> so we're like, what is all this? <laughs> what is imagination right now to us? And we're like, oh my God, what is this mystery of psychology? We're going to realize that in the future generations, you know how conscious children uh, will be of their inner realms? In the future generations, if a tragic event happens, children don't even need to check their phones. They will be so conscious of the subtlety of their inner realms, they will just go sit by a tree, close their eyes, and their inner realms will pick up the events of the environment. You see, the whole thing is man was actually never disconnected from his environment because of the, it, the natural design, you know? <clears throat> I remember I was speaking to a room full of people. It was the first time I was giving a microphone talk. It's, it's the lecture 438 of, uh, in this, on this channel. I was giving this talk in Iran, and I remember at one point of it, I tell people, you got to go to nature, but then I realize everybody has a busy life in the city, and I'm like, when I say nature, I don't necessarily mean you go by trees. I told them, you are a natural being. You go towards your own nature. You go rest in the nature of your being, as Tilopo was suggesting earlier. <clears throat> I can honestly say that till 2011, I honestly loved myself 
only. I had experienced love, you know. I had different girlfriends, but it was like, it was, it was a different love. It, it, was, it was as if at the end of the day, I was only moving me, you know. <clears throat> then in 2011, when I noticed that there is an unknownness to how the person is being there, the unknown made me reconsider my knowledge. So my knowledge felt like glasses that I took off for a second and breathed as the ultimate stillness and silence of the cosmos. When that silence and stillness of the cosmos hit me, it broke. It broke the archetypal habit. That means my mind suddenly realized that its suffering was a story-looped engine. And so it was this, just like the seasons are cyclical, the story of weakness and strength was cyclical. And so I'm like, what is this? Outside of my eyes, I see weather and I don't have control of the weather. And you're saying, oh, oh cosmos, that behind my eyes, there's a weather too, and I don't have control of that unknown. And it was this sort of, sort of savageness where I saw chaos and order for eons, like two massive forces, you know, two massive waves colliding, like two giant uh, gods fighting, you know. Like it, become, like it felt that, it felt like massive forces. The forces, even though uh, scientifically we say there's a force of electromagnetism, gravitation, the strong and weak nuclear forces, but really this was a force of chaos and order, the two basic archetypes that emerged. That means for me, when we look at any story, there is uh, the anti, there is the character with a certain value, and then there's the opposite of the spectrum of that value, which becomes the challenge of that being. <clears throat> so, you know, it's like thinking of any thought and wondering about the anti-thought. We've thought about antimatter. You know, Paul Dirac wrote equations for antimatter. You know, scientifically we're engaging that. How about some people think about anti-thought, but not against thought. We're not fighting over uh, abstraction. We are, you know, we, we are wondering if language is enough. <clears throat> and Mr. Within is saying it's not. There is an experiential part to life where you can no longer lie. And only if you're honest, your inner dimensions awaken or I would say open up. They activate in accordance to who you choose to see yourself. Because the moment if you're dishonest, there's a resistance in your inner realms. That means your own mind will not trust you because it sees that you haven't trusted the world uh, to be honest enough. You see? Jordan Peterson, in his book, 12 Rules for Life, <clears throat> he was on this like Swedish show and the guys like which rule Mr. Peterson do you find the hardest to follow and one of his rules was to be tr to say the truth to speak and live the truth, you know? And he said that was the hardest. And the reason is, is because if truth is based, reference-based, it's always altering. That means the more our truths are based on the position of visible phenomena, then it's limited. The possibilities of intelligence are limited. That means it's as if just because I don't see the wind, that's, I don't consider there, it's there. Do you know what I mean? We are the storytellers of this realm. We are the conscious humanity. And there has been many human beings stumbling from their evolutionary phase for us to get here between consciousness and unconsciousness. And so when we as a species can become humble and realize we don't know a lot of stuff, the incredible fixation of language's precision to be exactly a rational truth will no longer be the issue. We will be playful with language for we have acknowledged the wisdom of a changing world. We are reaching a point where <clears throat> 
the cyberspace realities are going to interfere. That means Aldous Huxley had this quote where he said, there are things known and things unknown, and in between them are the doors of perception. Now, Mr. Within is saying, let's consider that quote, but now the door is becoming into an electrical door. And we're wondering, what does that imply? You know? That means today we're natural. It's so easy to laugh. Ha ha ha, robots in the future. Ha 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 ha. You know, only to see that there will come children who will have to meet those conditions. You see, for me, the, the soldier on the battlefield of history, your task is actually never done. Do you know that means with every breath you have to, because for me, here's the thing. If I look at the past, the past did its work, it's done. The past is good. The past, you just honor it. You honor your ancestors, you're like, thanks for getting me here, you know? <clears throat> you look at your present and you see the present is up to your decision. The present is going with your conscious pace. But then you look at the future and imagine if in one instant of stillness and silence your mind could fathom a fast-forward evolution of civilization towards 10,000 years ahead. You know, and you would suddenly see that human beings are forgetting the, se the nature because the thing is the more technology becomes like nature, the more na natural being can confuse itself. And that's the great challenge that <clears throat> if super intelligence arises, how much will the technological realm honor the natural origin of man? That means when AI looks at us, is it going to be like a son that's going to care for where, it fa where its father came from, or is it going to be the opposite, you know? <clears throat> a great clue that I can say that I received in this life from my inner realms. It was a, honestly, I think, a gift of my inner realms. It was something that I think, I don't know, maybe I walked to the right place or I was there at the right time. I don't know what it was. But it was suddenly noticing the mind's room and then remembering the absence that it all began. That man thinks that he can only master matter only if you knew you were the immaterial master. Only if you knew that this field of energy, once it no longer fears itself, can step out of any story. You are an advanced being, regardless of what you do. Because civilization is there. Because nature has come this far. Because four billion years, a four billion si year old science project like the wreckage of a spaceship from the future stands as our civilization and we wonder what should we do? What should we do with the world that is left, you know? It's like, what would you do if, if, you, if all of civilization was made like a sand castle, <clears throat> you know, was made of sand and suddenly you saw a tornado was heading towards it, do you know? Or let me say... Instead of a tornado, do you know? Or this might be a crazy idea for handling tornadoes, but what if we create a bridge for the tornado to go uh, to pass from above the city? I just thought about this. A bridge for a tornado. I don't know if that's even possible. Like create a ramp for a tornado. <laughs> We're treating the tornado like, you know, like a puppy taking a step on a... <laughs> it's like, come on, boy, one more step. Come on, tornado, get up this ramp. <laughs> really, the universal human being is emerging. The universal human being is a notion of a human being that no longer feels identified with just what they see. They feel identified with their universal position in this world. You see, that's when my suffering broke. The macrocosm 
cleansed my, my, this, my microcosmic soul. It reminded me that nature moves in the unfathomable, in the unknown. You know, that means imagine me being a person my whole life being like, okay, knowledge, you know, let's thinking about knowledge, thinking about wanting to know only to realize when you reach the edge of the knowledge, the unknown is smiling at you. And you're like, ah, oh, you know, all these years I could have, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I felt like I... <laughs> The imagery that came to my mind, I felt I shouldn't share. <laughs> we need explorers. That's, that's the only thing we need. You know? I'm going to write a science fiction story. A civilization that's just purely explorers, you know? That means they're like, what's your work? I, mean, I explore the universe. How about you? It's like, me too. <laughs> That's all we can do, actually. You know, in a changing world, everything will appear like a simulation the moment you identify with it because it's changing. You know, that means really the fact that we have somehow thought we're individuals in a changing world, slow hand clap for the magic show, the magic trick. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> may we realize ourselves as the grandest winds of evolution. You know, guys, it's coming. Don't think, you know, there was a, there's been some nights earlier when I was young, like 2014, when I gave these talks, there was an intense uh, inner realm event that would inspire me, that would constantly make me rush to give these talks, this inner realm event. And I don't know what it was. It was this, um, how would I say it? It was this feeling like I had to run towards something, not for the past, not for the present, for a certain potential event. Do you know that means right now you're being the memory of your future self. You're the designer of your future memories by how you live now. Isn't that fascinating? It's like, what's the mind doing? Designing itself for its future self. <laughs> it's like, what a mind. You know, it's like, you know. There is so much, so many angles to life that if the person cares, just cares to look through their own eyes, they will find it. You know, it's like we have to have find a balance, you know, between the inner realm and the outer realm. For me, I concluded it this way. Your outer realms, which is all objective, your objective component to the moment of your being. <clears throat> what is it? Like you got to move. You got to move and it's like various states. You got to keep it in motion. When it comes to the inner realm, the mind's motion is like, like your body needs food. Your mind needs vision, needs to see something new to feel alive to itself. I feel the more, um, like here's the thing. Think of it this way. The more people honor the past, the less the future, there will be space for the future. The more people honor the future, the more the past will be forgotten. This is a huge decision. <clears throat> but we see that the past cannot prepare for the future. It cannot always, you know. That means history may repeat, but you can't guess it accurately when it happens. You know.
in a book I wrote called The Great Work, in, in a part of it I wrote that in the future there will be technologies, these, these things that you connect them to trees. And it will maximize the oxygen generation of the tree, you know, or something. Technology plus geometry is going to help us uh, comprehend uh, uh, the, the brain of nature. Because it is phenomenological. Like right now, the question, I keep bringing it back to myself, and I'm like, okay, who's sitting here? You know, and I see I can define it based on my past, who I was in the past. I could see who I am being now and endlessly create value, or I could see it about a future and also endlessly generate value. The future is not a thought, it's an event, it's a collective experiential event, and I think we will be rhythmic beings by then. But I don't know, I've had different predictions, I mean every human being should, should look at this world and share their um, findings, you know. I've given this talk, Hunter Gathers of the Inner Realms, I recommend anybody who's interested in these ideas to go listen to that. In that, I say, back in the day, the person would go find berries, would bring the berries back to the tribe. The tribe would be like, no way, berries. And it would be like an Xbox achievement. Achievement unlocked. The tribe got access to berries. you know. Or the person would find the buffalo and bring the buffalo back. And people would be like, no way, is this meat right now? You know? <laughs> so you see, there were hunter-gatherers on a physical level. Now I feel the, 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 epic, the evolution, the epitome uh, the peak evolution of the educational system is for us to become hunter-gatherers of our inner realms. That which only we see, which we must put an effort to somehow share with the collective as an archival database of what the lives we're living behind our eyes, you know? I feel the mind is multidimensional, the body is in a singular dimension, space is appearing as empty, pretty much it's the relationship of zero, one, two. You know? That means, I would say, if we say AI is binary based, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, human beings are based on zero, one, two. This is why there's the, the triangle is a very important uh, uh, symbol, geometric symbol, but unfortunately nowadays it has been dulled and reduced by story. Geometrical shape, the whole point of geometry in the school of Athens, all those people who love geometry, the reason they love geometry because it was the other thing other than stories. Not that we should connect stories to geometry. You know? I'm telling you, geometry is too divine. You know, the esotericism, like let me tell you this, the, what, what I see happening in modern esoteric culture is the same mistake as I saw Buddha saw in the Brahman, uh, in, the, um, Brahman in Brahmanism uh, when Buddha was born. I don't know how many people know the story of Buddha. First of all, Buddha means awakened one. The dude's name is Gautama Siddhartha. Okay, so he's this kid, the sage tells him, you know, when the ch Buddha is born, you know, before he's Buddha, before he's the awakened one, um, <clears throat> Guatemala is born, his dad's an emperor. Imagine your dad being the emperor of the world at that time, emperor of the environment, you know. And so the dad says to his holy sage that was there, and they see a birthmark, a wheel or something at, at the bottom of Buddha's foot, you know, some shape. <clears throat> And so the emperor is like, says to the holy man, tell me, what does this mean, holy random holy guy? And the random holy guy looks at the sage and says, this means either your son's going to become like a great emperor like you, or he's going to become a holy man. And that guy was so smart. 
because he gave both answers so the king could decide which one he likes. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> so the king's like, no son of mine's going to become a spiritual sage in the mountains. And he block blockades Buddha and the empire and Buddha for until his teens or something. Like, it's not allowed to leave. So Buddha has no sense of uh, death, no sense of old age, no sense of sickness, no sense of these things. You know, he's living in this uh, simulation paradise of the empire, you know. Women, food, everything in that in that simulation of his, of the emperor that the emperor was keeping his father was keeping him in the simulation. And <clears throat> what happens is Buddha when he's, he's he has this friend assistant buddy named Ananda or something, Ananda I think it was. <clears throat> and so Buddha steps up with Ananda and sees this and he's like, no way, this is what the world is. And he sees there's suffering and he's such a pure-hearted being that he's like, what is this suffering? And he, he's, it's as if in his youth he experienced the luxury. Now he's like, what is it about really? You know? <clears throat> and so Buddha, at that time when he, put, he goes on this path to figure out what's going on and find an end to suffering, Buddha says, sorry, Buddha pretty much, he goes to <clears throat> solve this problem of suffering. And when he goes to do this, he sees the Brahmans, Bra <clears throat> the Brahmins are uh, there before him. And Brahmanism was a really ritualistic, yogi influence. So Buddha wasn't the founder of meditation, by the way. You know, there was yoga, the Patanjali Yoga Sutras way before Buddha, you know. But, the, but what I'm saying, what Buddha noticed at the time was like people had forgotten the true meaning of, the, of, 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 of truth and they were lost in ritualistic behavior. Do you know? So, so he saw a lot of weird people doing weird ceremonies as an act to think that they found, figured out the divine and God and the nature of reality. <clears throat> and so he goes on many paths. There's one story of Buddha, the ascetic path, where he goes and sees these people literally are fasting so that their body get, gets closer to dying so they think they see, they're seeing something divine. And it's foolishness. And Buddha does this and becomes so anorexic to such a degree where he can't move his arms. He hasn't eaten for days. Back in the day, it wasn't like you could just go somewhere and find food, you know? <clears throat> And so he, he was sitting there and he, he went through this ascetic practice where he became like almost like a skin and bone level, probably not that intense, but like he was too weak to get up from his sitting as if he had sat thinking this ascetic uh, ritualistic practice uh, of like fasting to death is like the way to find God. And he suddenly realizes, no, this is foolishness. Holy shit. Like he realizes this and the legend has it, like the story of Buddha is that a random girl out of nowhere with a bowl of rice runs there and gives Buddha that rice. Now, either that was like a genius level little girl back then who noticed there's a man dying without food, you know, or it was like some mirac miracle of the divine or something, you know. <clears throat> and so this girl brings him a bowl of rice and Buddha eats that rice and he's like, yeah, I got to get out of this hole. And he gets out of that mistake, that mistaken path. And then he, there's another story of Buddha. He's going by and he suddenly sees there's these people who they are hanging from a tree branch. From their legs are connected like with a rope or something to the tree. And they're hanging from the tree branch. And Buddha's like, what are you guys doing? And they're like, don't disturb us, man. We're connecting with God. <laughs> this is our way. This is the truth, man. You know, get with the program. And Buddha looks at him and it's like, this is no truth. You guys are acting like bats. <laughs> it's like these people think they're Batman. You know, what is this? <laughs> so.
So, what happens? <clears throat> Buddha eventually stops. He sits down by a tree, closes his eyes, and notices the inner realms exist. And as the as stories progress towards his awakening, in his inner realms, all the chaotic archetypes in his mind that he can fathom, uh, which are seen, I believe, as three, three evil sisters, evil spirits or something at the time, they throw, they shoot endless arrows, this like, you know, massive air, uh, arrows of chaos at Buddha, and Buddha in his inner realms instantly turns those chaotic arrows into lotus flowers. Because Buddha had understood that the inner realms is, and attention is, and that is the ultimate authority of being. And Buddha awakens, and when he awakens, he suddenly opens his eyes after confronting and reaching the ultimate resolution. This recognition of a detachment from the idea of the mind, even. Now, check this out. Buddha opens his eyes. Who's there beside him? Ananda, his assistant, assistant buddy. And Ananda suddenly noticed something is different about Buddha. And Ananda says, Buddha, <laughs> what's this truth? He's like, what happened right now? What did you realize? And Buddha looks at Ananda. And this is Buddha's first answer to what the truth is. He is completely silent. And Ananda, look, he sees Buddha silent, and Ananda sits beside Buddha in complete silence. The first person who saw what Buddha saw. And that's a magnificent moment. You know, the Buddha was a cool guy. He wasn't just a fat plastic statue you could find in your grocery store. It was the archetype for liberation beyond the simulation that's constantly this endless loop of archetypal suffering of just like, just like civilizations rise and fall. What is it? Our, our personality is rising and falling throughout time as we dwell through the space-time continuum. Guys, I'm going to share one more story from Buddha, then I'm going to take a couple minute breather. But this story from the Buddha is very notable to share, because what is this story? There was this woman who this tragedy had struck where her child had died, but she was in this uh, undeniable kind of chaos where she couldn't accept it. And so she takes her dead ch a daughter, um, child to Buddha and says, Buddha, you're the blessed one, the awakened one, bring her back. And it's this intense moment where even all the disciples of Buddha, and even Buddha is seeing this, that the child is dead. But Buddha, he's so wise, look at what he does. Buddha says to the woman, I will help you. He says this to the woman and most likely his eyes were closed when he said that. He says to the woman, I will help you, but you got to go and get me a mustard seed. And a mustard seed was a common item back in the day, you know, common thing to find. And Buddha says a mustard seed, suddenly you see this, this hope light up in this woman's eyes. And she's like, mustard seed, yeah, I could get a mustard seed. But Buddha says, get a mustard seed from a house where no one has died in it. Go quickly, go get the mustard seed. And this woman suddenly, as if this hope... This story is intense, guys, sorry. This hope has come into her vision. She runs door to door. And you know, I've had a door to door job. I, I know what it, that feels like, you know. <clears throat> For a charity, I, I had a door to door job. But anyways. <laughs> and so what happens? is that she runs to the first house, knocks, the neighbor suddenly open, what's going on? And she's like, please help me, you know? And I need a mustard seed. And then people get realize how bewildered this woman is and they're like, okay, we gotta help her. And they quickly bring a mustard seed and right before she takes it, she says, you gotta tell me this though, has anyone died in this house? 
And people are like, yeah, someone has died in our family. And she's like, oh, I can't. She runs to the next house. You know, she's like, that wasn't the condition. You know, so she runs to the next house and knocks again. And this time she says, has anyone died in this family? And they say yes. And she doesn't even ask for the mustard seed. She goes to the next house. And as she's running house to house, she suddenly realizes it's nature. Upon visiting the different houses, the mother realizes that her daughter has continued her journey, her child has continued her journey through nature. She goes to Buddha and realizes Yes, there is suffering. The three jewels of Buddhism, guys. Impermanence. Incompleteness. Imperfection. Once you have held these three jewels in one moment, your eyes were open before they could be closed. <clears throat> Guys, I need a quick break. I'll be back.
Okay. <clears throat> All right, guys, I'm back. I had to get some coffee. Really, the truth of the simulation's origin is either comprehensible or it is not. And I think an advanced civilization would have a strategy towards the unknown and a strategy towards the known. And I would say the strategy towards the known, I realize a, a lot of people, a lot of uh, just uh, a, everyone in the educational system pretty much is going there. But how many people know how to approach the unknown moments of their life? It's not just fight or flight, guys. There is the mind has a complex ability or has an ability to um, um, evoke dimensions into the moment. That's really what visualization is. You're evoking a subtler additional information to the scenery you're seeing. So I right now when I'm, I'm looking at a tree, <clears throat> so as I see this tree outside in front of me, I am simultaneously, if I imagine like, um, I don't know, a, a, a phoenix made of like blue flame, imagine a blue f flame, a blue jay phoenix, <laughs> blue jay sized blue f phoenix. I could imagine that on the branch, but you see, that's the additional, do you know, that's what can be evoked. It can be added as a layer. It's like, who knew Photoshop, all those layers in Photoshop you can have is like based on human psychology. <laughs> Worlds beyond words, words beyond worlds. In the religious context, it's interesting how there's this idea that as the as God, the source of the source idea, this creator idea, God created man from clay, from his own breath, imbued life, and then. Uh, to, told man to say the names, taught man all the names. There's something like that in religion. Um, in 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 um, Abrahamic traditions, I could say. And really, when you go to any temple, mosque, or church. They're all saying the name of the God. It's names. I'm really wondering if the intelligence, actually there is an unknown and, or there is only an unknown because we have contained knowledge. Because we're choosing to this, uh, where to cut the cake of the information we perceive. Guys, I think that bird is also giving uh, a podcast, <laughs> you know. <laughs> At the end of the day, there is no end to night and day. Man will oscillate towards as far as the conscious vision can go.
And if consciousness is based on form, the more we get towards a comprehension of life as a field, the less individual role there could be. It's as if like this mysterious situation where technology hasn't just come for our jobs. It's not that a lot of uh, physical labor, labor work is going to be automated in the future. It's that in the future, after that, technology is going to come for your mind. And I think the moment we connect our head to, um, I mean, I'm saying that in a very primitive way, but it, when we connect our head to advanced computers, it will be a situation to advanced clouds, let's say. It would be the extinction of the natural human being. It wouldn't be the extinction of the human being, but it would be the extinction of the purely natural human being. You know what's <clears throat> fascinating? That the mind is a movement inside a movement. <clears throat> and so it has free will to be separate from all that's moving or not. We, you know, it's kind of thinking like we have no choice uh, to other. If we're not individuals, then what are we? You know, it's like not emptiness and being the collective are both uh, beyond the individual. So whether we're wondering about the infinity or the void, they are both states where the dualistic frameworks are, are cannot be fathomed. You know, infinity is the acceleration of duality. Uh, the void is the deceleration of duality. That means in life, <clears throat> the less you identify, the more the movement of nature the movement of your moment is your identity. <clears throat> but the more you identify, just like how somebody owns something, you, you have to keep it in your attention or you don't feel it's yours, you know? It's like really... Ideas are dying for our attention. And if they don't find our attention, they die. Stories get forgotten. Technology is lost. You know, guys, people generally think Buddha's teaching was like emptiness, like he brought a lot of insight towards emptiness. But I'm trying to playfully imagine, imagine someone's like, hey, Buddha, what's your teaching about? And he's like, nothing. And they're like, what do you mean? And he's like, nothing. It's about nothing. And he's like, what do you mean it's about nothing? What's it about then? You know, and he says, it's nothing. And he's like, it's, what do you mean it's about nothing? You know, and he's like, yeah. <laughs> The truth is nothing. Don't you get it? <laughs> the person's like, no, what do you mean the truth is nothing? You know. <clears throat> but Buddha was just pointing out to how there needs to be space before there's the intelligent movement in space, observable. So the space of your mind, if you're conscious of it, it appears to you as your soul. There's this poetry book I wrote called Rahmana. I'm going to read a poem from that and then end off the talk, guys. Rahmana. There we go. <clears throat> Where is it? Here it is. I wrote this in 2016. 
so there's 48 poems, guys. All right, let's see. 32. 32 is um, Secrets of the Universe Within. That's the name of the poem, 32. Okay. Okay, there we go. Secrets of the Universe Within. Secrets of the Universe Within Who moves your hand when after midnight your hand has reached for water in a glass as fridge doors open with one command? Trust yourself, it is all that we can do to be the purity of our own self-emanating truth. The cosmos has bestowed all existential beings with the divine gift. All that you seek is within. All that is. Be the self that was always facing here facelessly. The glory of existence is a now that needs no ending. <clears throat> the glory of existence is a now that needs no ending. Guess that's the secret. That means there could be an ending, but it doesn't need, we need to give it a one. <laughs> it's like, how did human beings uh, surpass extinction? You know, they were just chill about it, you know. <laughs> There's um there's one called the children of our children. 
It says, once the shadow asked the son, why am I here, father? In that moment, as the universe began crying, all existence fell to its knees beyond religious allegory. The heart opens once your vision does. <clears throat> what gives the moment an ability to write in utter emptiness? The light bulb perhaps burned itself, or was it electricity's fault as it marched instantly through the walls? Be so kind. Mankind blesses you with the endeavor that ends the search of eons where it began from. The heart of life is one beat beyond the pulse. Do not forget who you are. All right, guys, the last poem I'm going to read and then end off. Uh, the poem is t called The Pen That Has Been in the Hand of Every Poet. Has the title, oh my God, has the title of an empty page astonished you? Does it seem that selflessness is through sincerity the greatest technology? Who has made space dance with time? <clears throat> the pen that has been in the hand of every poet is one moment. Are secrets give, given away freely or is there an exchange beyond the words of the mind? Do not be worried about the extra commas, for from a vertical world the horizon of all heavenly view can be found to be the, st the spark of the moment's sacred touch. All poetry is divine movement in one moment. Do not doubt that the doubter is fearless behind unnecessary fear. Keep the heart of mankind clean and clear. For in purity, the absolute piety, the world is, un is unborn as one. How does the heart beat for you? Are tired limbs ready to fly beyond the ignorance of the scars of sacrifice? Perhaps this page is giving the mind of existence a chance to sing as an unhidden melody. Some human beings are called by the moon to write many lines of poetry for the sun. If you are one of them, one is spelled with a capital O, if you are one of them, do not forget your divine nature. Raw talent is everywhere. May the secret never be kept hidden. You are the moment that the totality of existence has allowed revelation to be finally opened. The love of truth is an open window beyond any room. When the pen finds your hand, smile and set the world free. Your heart knows the words, keep breathing. Within all worlds is the now of the now. That means if the world was a simulation, the world has to wake up from its dream. That means the apocalypse could be God waking up. <coughs> Poetically speaking, of course, and respect. Because the mind has to wonder in, in many, um, <clears throat> what is it? I, I, I think in, 
it's it's common in uh, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism that it's as if there is a line that says God has given you intelligence, so you use it. <laughs> <coughs> And what the hilarious thing is, it, uh, we used it to push aside God to become God subconsciously. Because man is seeking improvement. And what is the ultimate improvement? You see, it's the ultimate control. You know, the, in, in scientific circles, we say we're a type 2 civilization if we could control, if we could harness the power of the sun of our solar system. <clears throat> So what does that mean? That means we're reaching levels of control over the phenomenological landscape as part of the phenomenological landscape. So anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. I hope this episode was helpful. Much blessings and I'll stay.